Sahana Bhavatu Sahana Munaktu Sahaviryam Karavavahai Tejasvina Vadita Mastu Mavid Vishavahai Om Shanti 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 <coughs> May the Divine Being look over us lovingly as a mother and father. May the Divine Being support and nourish us as a mother and father. May we have the strength and skill to study together the art of spirituality. May no misunderstandings arise amongst us. So good morning, everyone. So good to see you all. Uh, we're in the middle of this talk on jnana. The main thing is to be devoted to God. Shankara said, be devoted to Brahman. and you will be able to control your senses and you will gain mastery over your mind. Master your mind and the sense of ego will be dissolved. In this manner, the yogi achieves an unbroken realization of the joy of Brahman. I misspoke, we're speaking about, we're speaking about yoga. Therefore, let the seeker try to give his heart to Brahman. It's a simple thing. Fix your heart, fix your mind and heart in God as often as you can. <clears throat> now, Swami Prabhupada used to put this very simply. He said, give everything in your life a Godward turn. Now, you need to figure that out for yourself, what that might mean. But if you just make that an aim to give everything a Godward turn, you're fixing your mind and heart in God as often as you can. If you're saying, how can I give this, washing my hands, a Godward turn? You can sing Alleluia to thee, Alleluia to thee, Alleluia, dear Master, Alleluia to thee, instead of Happy Birthday. Hmm? You can, uh, these are just simple things, simple things. Be childlike. There's no reason not to be just childlike. So just the attempt to give everything a Godward turn, how can I give this a Godward turn, will help fix your mind and heart and in God and uh, as often as you can. Before we go on, uh, are there any comments or questions about this idea of fixing your mind and heart in God as often as you can? <clears throat> and how that might be done for you. I'll give you another little example. The train comes by here often. It blows its whistle. So the thought arose in one of the devotees who lives nearby. Make that Rama as the engineer of the train. And the train is the Pushpaka. And how does Rama blow the whistle this time? Or is that Rama or is it Hanuman being more enthusiastic? Or is it Sita being very soft and gentle with the whistle? This is giving an ordinary thing that 
could be seen as an annoyance. Oh, there comes the train again blowing its whistle. Instead, it becomes Rama with his pushpaka uh, being driven either by Rama or by Hanuman or by Sita or by Kali. Mm, wild Kali, not in the engine, but on top of the engine, waving her sword and blowing that whistle for all she's worth. Mm. Sometimes the whistle is blown that way. <clears throat> so any thoughts or comments about this? Fix your mind and heart in God as often as you can. Swami Prabhupada put it, give everything a Godward turn. Swami Sri Dharananda said, divinize your life. Swami Vivekananda in Jnana Yoga says, deify your life. It's all the same message. I try to chant my mantra. Well, when you say you try, uh, Balakrishna, that's an odd word to use. Well, okay. well, you either do or you do not. No, no, no. I do it, but sometimes, you know, if I have to involve with something, you know, where I have to put my mind to it, maybe I will forget about it. But well, yes, of course. Sometimes there are, if it is something, things. yeah. There, there's where the trick comes in of giving whatever you're doing a Godward turn. Say you're balancing your checkbook. Hmm? Well, Swami Prabhavananda would say, well, in that case, just remember that the money that you're dealing with is not yours, it's the Lord's. So that's the way to give that a Godward turn. Mm -hmm. So yes, saying your mantra, your mantra, your mantra truly is your best friend. It Because it contains the vibration that is most congenial toward uh, to most congenial to transforming your uh, your mind and your heart, transforming your mind and cleansing your heart. So when you chant your mantra and you're thinking of worldly things while chanting your mantra, you feel like you're not really doing much, but even that has some benefit. Correct? That's what Holy Mother says. Holy Mother says even doing it mechanically has benefit. Because it is the vibration. It is the vibration. If you bring your attention to it, it has an even greater benefit, of course. But Holy Mother is very clear that even doing the uh, mantra mechanically, uh, one of Sri Ramakrishna's dear devotees and supporters was Balaram Bose. Balaram came from a wealthy family and Sri Ramakrishna uh, would often visit <coughs> Balaram Bose's house, particularly in the last three years of his life. Uh, and one time, uh, Balaram Bose's father often was there when the master came. And Balaram Bose's father had the habit of, of saying his beads uh, pretty much continuously. Uh, and uh, But of course, because he wasn't paying full attention to it, uh, it was being done somewhat mechanically some of the time. And so Sri Ramakrishna remarked, just uh, joking with him, he said, oh, Balaram Bose's father, he said, what would otherwise take a year will for him take a year and a half. So it isn't that it wouldn't happen. It's just that it would take longer because he was chanting the mantra mechanically much of the time. Mother Shankara? Yes, dear. What if you're saying it um, mentally rather than saying it out loud? Oh, well, that's, that's more powerful. That's the most powerful. 
uh, if you're saying it mentally. Saying it out loud is good. Saying it silently, uh, that is just with saying the words with your throat and so on, and maybe even moving your lips a little is better. Saying it particularly with full attention uh, in the mind silently is the strongest. Good question. Um, Brother Shankara? Yes, I am. Um, I would like to share um, a recent experience I had in um, defying um, a certain action. I was messaging with my um, son and uh, daughter-in-law and basically reassuring them about my progress in my health. Uh -huh. And they were very relieved to hear that and likewise they had gotten over the side effects of the vaccine and so both felt uh, relieved over each other so then the thought came to me that let me send this feeling to god uh, that that peace that or that um that comfort that came with um the mutual reassurance because god wants also to hear that uh, you know, the, the progress I'm making, or I'm not, I'm not able to express exactly what I felt at that moment, but I basically gave it to God because God would like to hear too, call it gratitude or um, that comfort that I felt and received, I kind of turned it towards God. Is that an example of deification? Oh, absolutely. And it, and it is it is precisely what Sri Krishna is talking about in chapter four of the Gita, when he talks about the yoga of renunciation. You took your feeling and offered it to God. Uh, and uh, understanding that God is in constant relationship with us, whether we're uh, aware of it or not, and so when we take our feelings and our thoughts and our perceptions and offer them to God, uh, it is uh, not only a, an uplifting experience for us at the moment, but it also frees us from the karma. Hmm. It is now, uh, everything is being offered to God. And so God assumes the karma rather than it being, it doesn't remain with us. Very, very beneficial. Thank you, Swayam. That's a very good example of deification indeed, of giving it a Godward turn. That those moments, those feelings, that relationship with your son and daughter-in-law, so on. Wonderful. Anything else from anyone? Thank you. Okay, back to the Swami. The gross mind has to be controlled and made subtle or pure. Quote, the then man abides in his real nature, says Patanjali. When the mind is subtle, becomes subtle or pure, Sri Ramakrishna says, when it becomes a ripe ego, a ripe mind, then man abides in his real nature, says Patanjali. What is that true nature? Satchidananda, which is pure consciousness, life eternal, and abiding love and infinite joy. Let me repeat that. <laughs> what, this, is, this is the promise. This is the promise. These, these promises come. The gross mind has to be controlled and made subtle or pure. Quote, then man abides in his real nature, unquote, says Patanjali. What is that true nature? Satchidananda Brahman, which is pure consciousness, life eternal, and abiding love and infinite joy. That is your true nature the Atman, 
which is one with Brahman. Now, is everyone clear? And please, let's not go ahead unless you're clear about this. If anyone isn't clear about how we can both experience the Atman as the witness and the Atman at the same time be one with Brahman, which is actionless, changeless, eternal, infinite. If anyone is unclear about that, please do ask the question or make it, make it known, because it's so very important that we understand what is meant by the Atman being one with Brahman and yet present to us as an embodied being. Okay. <clears throat> Pure consciousness, life eternal, and abiding love and infinite joy, that is your true nature, the Atman, which is one with Brahman. When the mind is kept under complete control, then your true nature becomes revealed to you. And then you have, attu you have attained the fulfillment of human birth and life. When the mind is kept under complete control. Does this mean like gripping it and holding it? And No, it does not mean that at all. The mind is brought under control by what the Swami said before. You give everything in your life a Godward turn. You fix your mind and heart in God constantly over and over and over and over. And at some point you find, oh, this is coming under control. I'm aware of what I'm thinking. I'm aware when a thought arises, when a feeling arises. And so I can then deal with it appropriately. So kept under complete control does not mean that you're holding it in an iron grip. That won't work at all. Mm -hmm. It is releasing everything that wants to bind the mind to its lower nature. When you are able to release these things and give them the God return or fix your mind and, and heart in God <clears throat> or deify or uh, divinize, however it best suits your thinking, then that is under complete control. And when that happens, spontaneously, spontaneously, your true nature becomes revealed to you. And then you have attained the fulfillment of human birth and life. Because your true nature is always there disguised by the distractions. So as long as we like to play with the distractions, and that's not bad or wrong, it's just less. So as long as we like to play with the distractions, then we will be contained, limited by the distractions. But when we decide, oh, this, I don't like this limitation anymore. I want to be less limited, unlimited. Then you begin to release those things. And one of the best ways, as we were just discussing with Swayam, one of the best ways to release them is to offer them to the Divine Presence. Brother Shankara? Yes, dear. This is Nira here. 
Yes. And I have a question. Um, I understand uh, what you're talking about here about the giving every thought uh, action and You moved off the mic, dear. I can't hear you. Oh, but I, I was referring to the purification. We are assuming that it is a purified mind at this stage. Well, it's, it's the pro. It's the process. It isn't, it, you know, it's <clears throat> when, when you reach the fulfillment and your true original nature becomes known to you in an immediate sense, the living presence, as Swami Prabhupada called it, becomes, you become aware of it. That is the Atman, that is Saguna Brahman as the Atman, Brahman with attributes. This is the this is the tricky part about the Atman. The Atman is simultaneously Saguna Brahman, Brahman with attributes, and Nirguna Brahman, Brahman without attributes. And this 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 confounded even Swami Vivekananda or Narendra in the beginning. He couldn't he couldn't uh, get his mind around it. So it took even Narendra a while. You know, he was a teenager still when this was the case, late teens and early twenties. So it's 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 not an it's it's not something that will be intellectually understood. It's something that comes to you by experience, and once you've experienced it even a little, then you understand in that way that is beyond thought and speech. Is that clear, Nero? Hari Om, Brother Shankara. Yes, Vijay. Speaking of just what you said a moment ago, that it's not intellectual level that we have to understand the concept, but First, I agree with you on what you said. However, from a practical standpoint, I also believe that before I reach that higher stage, I have to first pass through this intellectual understanding, but not give it that importance that we humans end up giving it, knowing that this is a path to the next stage. In other words, you're, you're precisely right, VJ. That's what we're doing this morning. Mm -hmm. We're gaining an intellectual understanding of it so that we can do what is necessary to attain the deeper understanding, the empirical understanding. You're absolutely right. We must pass through the intellectual stage. But as you also said, it's good not to give it too much importance, not to reason about it too much, because that just is, uh, it, it, what it is, is it's an exitless maze, that reasoning. Thank you. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Anyone else? Okay. The Atman, which is within each one of us, is not affected, is never affected by anything. <clears throat> not, by your, not by our actions, our thoughts, or our deeds. In other words, you are always Brahman and nothing else. I'm going to repeat that. Krishna says in the Gita, that the Atman witnesses our actions and thereby validates them. That's said in chapter five. But it isn't affected by them. Nothing about the Atman changes because of whatever action, positive or negative, good or evil in our language, it witnesses. 
This Atman, which is within each one of us, is never affected by anyone, not by our, by anything, is not never affected by anything, not by our actions, our thoughts, or our deeds. In other words, you are always Brahman and nothing else. As my master said, he saw Brahman in so many masks, the mask of a thief, the man, the of a, of a lustful man, of a saint. He saw Brahman in so many masks, the mask of a thief, of a lustful man, of a saint. But it was all Brahman, one reality. A great seer or yogi who is one, a great seer or yogi who is one who has attained that knowledge, a great seer or yogi is one who has attained that knowledge, who loves everybody, who loves the reality, God within, and who sees that same God everywhere. So is there any comment or question about that ability to see in, in Brahman everywhere and thereby love everything and everyone as that reality? Okay. How do you do that? How do you see God in <clears throat> the wicked? And how do you do that? You fix your mind and heart in God, as the Swami said. Mm -hmm. You give everything a Godward turn or deify. This you are doing before you experience it. You're in, in common terms. You're taking a stand for it. Mm -hmm. You're asserting to yourself, I have a tentative belief and faith in this because the scriptures and the Swamis tell me it's so. And so when someone offends me, I remember what Swami Vivekananda said. Praiser praised, blamer blamed are one. Praiser praised, blamer blamed are one. When someone does something that we think is offensive, we see the divine in them. The Christians say it this way, love hate the sin or abominate the sin and love the sinner abominate the sin and love the sinner which is the teaching of christ so we do it by repeated practice and assertion satyagraha of the truth this is how mahatma gandhi was able to uh, discipline himself and offer that discipline to his followers so that they could be beaten with rifle butts and batons and and set upon in terrible ways and yet not respond because they were insisting on the divinity of their oppressor even though the oppressor was acting horribly toward them at the moment the same thing was true of martin luther king here in the United States. I was fortunate enough to know one of the men who trained those young people. His name was Dr. James Lawson. He was a Methodist minister. And this is what he taught. You must insist on the divinity of even the wicked even the oppressor. It, it is something that comes with training. 
just as you would not learn to be a chess champion in a matter of weeks. You're not going to learn to see the divine in everyone and everywhere in a matter of weeks. It's a matter of years, many years of constant practice. But the Swami has been giving us the instruction here uh, on fix your mind and heart in God. That is to say, try and see everything in terms of God, give it a Godward turn. And as I said, be simple, be childlike about it. You don't have to be fancy. Have fun with it. Have fun with the idea that everything is, is God. I gave the example of instead of singing happy birthday when you're washing your hands, because we need to so often wash our hands, uh, sing Alleluia to thee. Uh, instead of uh, being annoyed that the train is coming again and blowing the its whistle in the middle of the night, say, oh, there comes the, the pushpaka, and, uh, and it, who's blowing the horn? How is the horn bling, being blown? Oh, that, that sounds uh, like Hanuman. It's very enthusiastic blowing the horn. And so on. Or you can do like uh, Swayam said. You offer the feelings and, and uh, impressions of the moment. You offer the emotion and, and your strong responses to things. You offer them to the divine presence. And it's something that you just keeping it in mind to do it. As, as uh, Balakrishna said, you repeat your mantra. And, uh, you know, so, and, and the comment was made in the times when it, you can't repeat your mantra, try and think what I'm doing is also the divine. You know, I said, you're balancing your checkbook, so you're remembering that the money isn't yours, it's, it's Sri Ramakrishna's or the divine presence's. Nothing belongs to you, according to Sri Krishna in chapter 3 and 4 of the Gita. And uh, certainly this was said over and over to us by the Swamis. Anything else? Yes, Brother Shankar, I have a question. Yes, please. Um, so the, the methods and ways about doing this definitely are, are certainly helpful, but I, I think I have, my question is, what is it that prevents one from seeing Brahman in all? It's, a, it's as simple as this, the distractions. It's the, it's the habit we have of living in our left hemisphere with all of its conversation and its love of its distractions. It likes to be attracted to things. It likes to be averse to things. It likes to think things through. It likes to be angry. Whatever it is that, uh, uh, as, as Swami Sarvapriyananda said one time after having expounded the, the, the depth and breadth of Advaita Vedanta, he said to us the next day, well, how much has your behavior changed based on this? And he raised his own hand and said, not much has it. We have to admit that the reason is because we like it. We like the distractions. Now, who created the distractions? It was not us. Maya is the distractions. And Maya and its servants, the gunas, are the creators of these distractions, sattva, rajas, and tamas. <clears throat> so it's a matter of 
our deciding, I want to have different priorities. I want to be free of this. This is a limitation. I'm tired of it. I'm weary of this limitation. And so I will do what is necessary to be free of it and to move into an ever more unlimited state. And if you want to understand the, the step-by-stepness of this, read chapters one and two of Patanjali's Yoga Sutras, particularly as translated by Swami Prabhavananda, translated and commented on by Swami Prabhavananda uh, in the book, How to Know God, which is his, his rendering of that, those, that scripture. Another place to read about it in modern language and in ways that are so easy to understand is Jill Bolte Taylor's book, My Stroke of Insight, in which she, through a massive stroke, is deprived of her left hemisphere and finds to her great surprise that there is a whole other realm and personality pre-existing always existing, ever existing, that she identified as being the personality and attributes of the right hemisphere or the heart. They're, they're very parallel, Patanjali's teachings and Jill Bolte Taylor's findings. Jill Bolte Taylor was not a spiritual seeker in the sense that we're talking about. She was a Harvard-trained and practicing neuroanatomist. But that book is absolutely astounding. And if you want just a little introduction to it, she did a TED Talk on my stroke of insight. Jill Bolte Taylor, uh, the middle name is spelled B-O-L-T-E, um, and you'll find that on, and, and if you want a fuller introduction to her experience in the book, it's there. Uh, Brother Sakura? Yes, Robert. Uh, I, I'd like to share something uh, about that particular question that the gentleman just came up with. Uh, I, I separate the person from the act. Mm -hmm. hey, I want you to tell me, is this a proper way of doing it. I, I, I try. The problem then becomes it's difficult separating the person from the act sometimes. But if when I'm successful at separate, separating the person from the act, then I can I can love the person but not appreciate the act. Uh-huh. Well this is exactly what's meant by that Christian scripture. Abominate the sin, love the sinner. And, and Christ said, love thine enemy. He who asks you for your coat, run after him and give him your cloak also. Now there's a wonderful story told by Sri Ramakrishna in the gospel. Now this is giving, this is giving meaning to the word, to the words, give everything a Godward turn. A, a man's guru told him that everything is Rama. Everything is Rama. So one day the man is sitting in his semi-outdoor kitchen and he's cut a piece of bread and he's got it there. And a dog runs up and grabs it and runs off with the bread. And the man grabs the jar of of butter that he has beside him and runs after the dog saying, Oh Rama, oh Rama, wait just a minute, stop, stop, the bread has not been buttered. So rather than reacting to the dog's theft of the bread with anger and resentment, he sees, he's practicing what his guru told him. This is 
the Lord in the form of a dog who has taken your bread. And so the rest of the story is as I told it. So you're absolutely right, Robert. Separate the two. And then give the highest interpretation you can to both. Now, that does not mean that as a society, we can condone acts like the man who went and uh, killed those eight people uh, in, the, in recent days. Of course, that man must be captured, contained, <clears throat> and, uh, and prevented from doing such things again. But you can research the life of Father Thomas Keating and find that he went to prisons and visited the most, the, those who had committed the most heinous of crimes. And in the role of transformer, transformed their lives by loving them and listening to them and being with them in a way that no one had ever been with them before. So you're absolutely right, Robert. We need to separate the act and the actor and then deal with each of those components to the best of our ability. Should, should one attempt to, to, to modify the behavior of a person like that, or should you just leave it alone? <clears throat> Sri Ramakrishna and his Swamis will tell you, don't try to modify the behavior of anyone else unless you have God's command. And if you receive God's command, it will be unmistakable. You won't have to guess about it. Mm -hmm. okay. And so Swami Prabhupada said, people have a right to their pain and suffering. Do not try to remove it. Sustain and comfort. So that's all that Father Thomas Keating was doing when he went to see these people. He did not go with the idea of changing them. He went with the idea of sustaining and comforting them. And that sustenance, that comfort in the form of love and attention was transformative by their testimony, not by his, by the testimony of the prisoners that he visited. It's a very hard thing to be a, to be a, 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 a missionary to prisoners, to go and, and offer them that, because it's so easy to get your own um, distractions and, and habits involved. You have to be prison ministry is very difficult. I know people who have done it and they speak about this. Can I make a comment, Brother Shankara? Please, Ima. With my past experience with the prisoners and the people who came from jail, like the other shooting that it happened, uh, we can't change them unless they want to transform themselves to be get the layers out of it and see their atman. I know they are all good people, but they did commit bad acts uh, after the prison and then get sent them to the addiction centers. Uh, I have dealt with several people like that, and we won't be able to change them unless they are willing to transform their life to get better and to get back their original self. 
Well, that's that's why the Swami said people have a right to their pain and suffering. Exactly. Do not try to remove it. We can we can help them. We can help them on that path. We can have, we can sustain them and comfort yes. them. They have we to can be serve them in that way. Yes. Exactly. We can give them uh, tools. We can give them all the things. Offer you know AAs and SAs and NAs and all these things. And but that's they have to be willing to, they have to be there. And also, MLK's letter from the Birmingham prison is very transformative to anyone who can read that. It's oh, yes. you gave it to me, I read it a couple of times. It is just so beautiful how nicely what Haima was talking about is Martin Luther King Jr.'s letter from Birmingham jail. Birmingham jail. Uh, the reason he wrote it was a number of ministers of his acquaintance and some that he didn't know had written to him saying, Martin, don't do this. You're bringing discredit on our profession and uh, you're, you're, you know, don't, that's not your job to transform society and so on. And I won't try and tell you what he said, but I encourage you to read it. Yes. Because I, I take it he was in Birmingham jail when he wrote that letter? He yes. was indeed. Letter from the Birmingham jail. Yes. A letter. A very transformative effect on anyone who can be open hearted and read that letter. Mm -hmm. uh, I think he had all the qualities of forbearance, equanimity, uh, fortitude, everything I could see. I think he had all the qualities of what the Realizing God book explains. Yes. Uh, it's a very nice letter. I think it's 14 pages or 12 pages. It's, 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 it's a long letter. It's a long letter. I do have the PDF you sent, Brother Shankara. I'd be happy to send it to anyone if I know their emails. Yes, Haima, I'd like to take a look at it. And I would say that you know, Martin Luther King has a statue in Washington, and I don't think any of his critics have a statue. So that says something. Send me your email right now, and then I'll write it down. Right, yeah, I'll put it in the chat. Okay, sure. Thanks. Yes, Hemaji. Yes. You can, send the, you can send the PDF to me also. Please, sure. Just send me the emails or something like that to me, and then I'll be happy to forward it to you what Brother Shankar gave it to me. Sure. I will do that. I'll text my email to you. Okay, sure. Okay. Anything else from anyone? Uh, yes, to add to what Robert said and Haima a bit, um, as a, in my former career as a naval officer, I actually used to visit prisoners in the prison. Mm -hmm. And some of them were good guys who made a mistake with crack cocaine and got addicted and did stupid things. And mm -hmm. that's uh -huh. how they got themselves landed in jail. But some of the guys were truly evil. And I asked one of them when he told me what he had done, I said, don't you feel guilty? Don't you feel bad about what you've done? And he said, no, it, it didn't bother him one bit. So that really was a lesson to me that some people don't have any sense of conscience. Well, the, 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 the wonderful uh, and very troubled comedian Richard Pryor uh, had uh, this kind of romantic notion about prisoners in jail, those who had committed heinous crimes. And he was not a missionary. He just he, you know, had this idea. So he thought, I'll, I'll just go there and I'll, I'll do my comedy act at the prison. And I'll see some of these guys. And these were the hardcore types that you just talked about. And when he came back, he said, oh, my God, keep them there. Keep them there. Wasn't he in prison for some time for um, drug possession? I think oh, yeah. Was... Well, they, yeah. But that, 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 these were two separate incidents. Okay. Yeah, he wasn't in prison. He was in jail. Yeah, he, 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 he became addicted to crack cocaine. But uh, there are people who... So what, Brother Shankar, what was his experience? Richard Pryor? I didn't understand quite. Richard that. Pryor uh, had this romantic idea that these people who were in prison, many of them, for very terrible, terrible crimes, were there unjustly. Mm -hmm. uh, so he went to this particular prison, I've forgotten the name of it, 
Um, but it was it's one of the really hardcore prisons. And he did his comedy act for them. And the prisoners were very appreciative, of course, of that. But then he visited some of these people. He went to talk to them. And he came away saying, oh, my God, keep them there. Keep them in there. Yeah, I, I agree they, with Richard. I had a similar experience that I thought they were unjustly there. And then when I actually met him and talked to him, I'm like, keep them well, there. That's, that's they should not I, be out on the streets. That's what I was reacting to, Brahmanas, the ones who were remorseless, who had no remorse and would clearly commit such acts again if they were permitted to be free among us. And uh, so, um, but as we go back to what Robert Ayers said, so separate in your mind the act and the actor, and then give the highest interpretation you can to both. Divinize both to the best of your ability. Understanding, if we are to believe what we're told by the scriptures and by the swamis and other great teachers, that even the most hardcore criminal, <clears throat> the most heinous criminal, is also one with Brahman. It's just that they are so deeply immersed in ignorance that they're capable of things that are not permissible in society. So this is why abominate the sin. This is the Christian way of saying it. Abominate the sin, love the sinner. The higher, the higher way is not even to abominate the sin, but to see the, the sin also as an act of the divine, since there is nothing else, as St. Thomas Aquinas said, you cannot be what God is not. So uh, this is very difficult for us to get our minds around. And so it's, it's, this is why it's not an intellectual exercise. It is one where we come to this realization through experience. Um, Brother Shankara? Yes, so I am. Um, I was going to add that um, whenever these stories come out of somebody who's done these heinous um, acts and their profile comes out, there's always somebody, whether it's a neighbor or a classmate or a roommate, who doesn't see that person the same mm -hmm. as they knew that, oh, this one could have done this crime. They cannot even believe it. Mm -hmm. And many of the times these people do have like, some deep-seated hurt which either they've not been able to obtain the right kind of help or misguided um, way that they have um, chosen to express that hurt yes um, i guess the deeper the hurt goes the harder it is for them probably to 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 come out of it um, yeah. i know that for the victims who are directly impacted it would be very very difficult to see past that. Yes. But for those that are not directly impacted, I think it's a little bit easier to separate yes. um, the act from the person. Pope John Paul II, if you remember, was a, a, an assassination was attempted by a Bulgarian who was an assigned assassin. And he didn't manage to kill the Pope, Pope John Paul II. And John Paul II, after some time, went to see the man in prison and forgave him. And for the assassin, it was a transformative experience. 
But not all of us, as we sit here this morning, are going to be John Paul II. He was, after all, elected by his peers as Pope of the Catholic Church. And so this is an unusual holy man but it is an exemplary act because the man just missed shooting him in the heart. Anything else? Yes, Brother Shankar. Yes, Vijay. Today we spoke of Maya and his gunas being the creators of the distraction and uh, I have a question and also more than a question, a need for clarification on the concept, uh, on the concept of gunas. Now, we have talked more than once that gunas don't belong to a person, to an individual. Gunas belong to Maya. Gunas are there, just like a fragrance of five different kinds, and I can choose which one I want to choose. So there are three gunas with all the attributes in each of them. Now, with that background, is it correct to say that when the different fragrances are there, the good and not so good is there. I don't want to call bad, but good and not so good, both are there. And it's for me then to say, this is for me, and this not so good is not for me. And that's how I apply my discrimination in my practical life. Yes. The first so question. This, is that right? This is what Patanjali calls uh, discriminating between the good and the pleasant. The second clarification, please. Just like we say the world is real, and yet it's not real. Meaning that from Vedanta point of view, the world is not real because it's not permanent. But it is real so long as there's a table and I'm touching it, there's a food and I'm eating it with my body, mind, intellect complex. The same way, Am I correct that we can say that gunas, uh, that gunas are there for me in the beginning or for anyone in the beginning to accept the concept that they don't belong to me, I have to start at the intellectual level and then go beyond it. That yes, they don't belong to me. They are there just like the fragrances. The breeze comes and pre presents the different fragrances, fragrances to me. What I'm saying is that there again to absorb the concept, we have to begin first by keeping in mind the world is real and yet it's not real. Well, uh, yes, the, the world is real in the sense that maya is eternal and therefore its products with though they're ever changing are also eternal so we look at what is the substratum that is the reality behind the appearance and that why we say that the world is provisionally real or uh, as a super imposition on reality. But as far as the gunas go, the gunas are not mysterious. The gunas are precisely like the elements of the periodic table in chemistry. We don't have any difficulty at all with the idea that oxygen and hydrogen, hydrogen and carbon form a molecule and we call it a hydrocarbon and 
various forms of hydrocarbons are combustible. This perfectly ordinary thinking for us. Oxygen, hydrogen, carbon, three elements. They combine, they compound, and they make a hydrocarbon, various kinds of hydrocarbons, depending on how much of each. <coughs> the same is exactly true of the gunas. And if you study Sankhya, which means enumeration or counting, you'll see that they come up with something that is quite reminiscent. This is Kapila, by they I mean Kapila, came up with this diagram of how various compounded substances or realities appear out of just these three gunas. Just so much of this and so much of that and so much of the other and you get this. Well, it's, it's just exactly like chemistry. So the gunas do not belong to anyone. They are the tools of Mahamaya, of Maya, of Shakti, to produce this ever-changing reality that we call life. I mean, for us to deny that this is real is preposterous. Here we sit, all of you wonderful people appearing on the screen, each in your own place, having your own experiences. This is a reality, but it's a temporary, ever-changing reality. And so it is a different reality than the reality of the eternal, changeless, and infinite which is our true original nature on which this is something that has this, we, we experience this and the, here's the great secret, because we wish to. And when we stop wishing to, when we've had enough of it, then we begin the process of Un, undoing our attachment to that which we have liked for so long. And that's what we've been talking about so far this morning. What it is, what that is, and how to go about it. Thank you very much. Anyone else? Well, let's talk about something. On uh, when we see a know about a person that's done these things, these negative things that we're talking about, we also participate in 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 in, in creating that. Maybe not. That's the wrong word. We we we, just, we, we also participate in maintaining a negative attitude because we see that person as a villain. And the moment we see that person as a villain, <laughs> our mind, <clears throat> are you all right? I'm sorry, repeat that last you one. You all right? Yeah, I'm fine. Okay. The minute we call them a victim, see them as a victim, our minds, bring up stuff that we assign to that person that we imagine. Yes, exactly, exactly. Which is why Sri Ramakrishna says in the gospel, a child in a room with a bag full of gold, <clears throat> in comes a, a thief and takes the gold because our mind is constantly bringing things to it, to this whole situation yes. that, that are not necessarily so. Well, that's, like, why, that's why I characterize the mind as an exitless maze. 
a maze of all these prior impressions that we compound and combine and make into just exactly what you just said. Our, our understanding of or our belief about a certain situation, person. So, Brother Shankara, exactly yes, what Robert was saying to separate the, the act from the actor, it will apply also to us, to separate us from our past negative experiences or impressions, like you said. Yes, we have to insist over and over that Krishna is telling us the truth when he says we are not the doer. And but if we don't do it, and if we don't do it, we'll participate. Excuse me, if we don't do it, we're, we're contributing to this whole sex and drag thing without re recognizing the fact that we are contributing to this whole situation. Precisely. Precisely. So, Brother Shankara, what should we do in that case is just to be an observer as a witness, but not relate to that what we see like the act being done you know <clears throat> Saint and not Francis kind of, of let your mind go into your own past and association you know that with the association comes the bad memories of Saint, your own saint francis of assisi said true love and compassion can only come from your eyes when you admit that you are capable of any act. <laughs> and the first place you direct that love and compassion is toward yourself. <laughs> then you're able to be compassionate with others. So yes, Nira, you separate yourself from the act. Who is the self that is separating? It is the Atman not your ego. The mm -hmm. ego is a fiction. The ego is a creation. It is a creation of our love, of attraction and aversion, of all of the distractions. It is our love of Maya. <clears throat> so we can love and admire Maya, mother, and her all of her creation. And we can understand that she is the great goddess as well as the great demoness. She has her extremely beneficent forms and her exceedingly terrible forms. Yeah, because I was, I, when I was talking about that, I wanted to finish with, with that person that we are calling this villain this, that person loves someone. Mm -hmm. Most of the time it's to like their mother or something. <clears throat> yes. and, and many times that act that we see is such a negative act, that person sometimes could be performing that act to, to and they believe that they are, by doing this act, they are doing something to contribute to this person that they love. Yes, that's absolutely and that, true. And that negative act, could its source could be a giving source just misguided from the ignorance. Well, that's... The so if the person <laughs> had dealt with their mind first, before trying to help anybody, before trying to do anything outside of the self, if you can bring your mind under your control, where you can train it to, to, to not react in certain ways, but react in other certain ways. And that's what these swamis are trying to teach us, to get us to have our minds to react in a way that's going to contribute to ourselves and others exactly. at the same time. Who are the people, if we look around now and in history, who are the people that are remembered for being transformative? Someone brought up, there's a statue, I think Brahmadas brought up, there's a statue of Martin Luther King in Washington, but not of his critics. Who are the people that we remember? 
they're the people who've been transformative in the world in a in a in a really beneficent beneficent sense what was what is their characteristics they are in full control of their awareness and their expression of that awareness in the world it's just ex exactly what the swami was saying to us earlier so our if we want to be of benefit to the world first learn to be a benefit to ourselves yes first learn to love and be caring for ourselves and as nero was just pointing out that means we learn to separate our actions from ourself because the lovable self is the atman every one of us has a personality <laughs> aspects of that personality are lovable or they're the ones that reflect the atman and other aspects of that personality are emphatically not so lovable and so it can't be our personality so we learn to care for our personality we learn to take care of this person who appears to be acting in the world first and and then we are able to control our minds because we've given everything a Godward turn. We've divinized it, deified it, fixed our minds in hearts in God. And then we are beneficial to the world. Better equipped at least. Better equipped at least. Thank you. <laughs> Anything else from anyone? Brother Shankar, I think we could have one day retreat for every page of this book. We yes. could. <laughs> yes. It's so nice to discuss this. There are so yes. Many yes, indeed, we could, dear. Yes. To, to that effect, Haima, the book Brother Shankar had mentioned, The Yoga Aphorisms, Aphorisms of Patanjali. Um, I've been reading it every day, but I every passage every verse is so full of depth and breadth that i have to stop and think about it and read it again and read it slowly that's why i'm getting through this book so slowly yes exactly and that's the way to read it thank you both any anything else from anyone i i just want to make one last comment i know we're running out of time uh, it's like we have to learn to respond instead of reacting to a situation. And we have to emotionally detach, like Karma Yoga says, renunciation, detachment, but at the same time, loving the person that we are in relationship with. We have to emotionally detach. If we make that emotional detachment, it's easier to love for what they are, like Robert, Robert Frost says, love for what they are not for what they ought to be you know yes very well said that can that can it's a slow process daily programming in our brains every day we have to tell ourselves like to work on this is thousand times we may fall down but we may get up and thousand and one times that happens yeah it's, it's yes. not an easy thing it's a tough yes. thing. all of we'll, us we'll never make any progress unless we're willing to make mistakes unless Yes, unless we try it every single day. Thank you, Brother Shankar. Thank you. Anyone else, dear? Yeah, just uh, one quick thing. I wanted to say something to Robert. Robert, I sent you a direct message. Um, let me know if you get that and, and if you're open to that. Because uh, I don't know if you saw it here, but I'm just trying to see if you'd be interested to have a chat one day. No, I didn't see it. I, I don't know how to use that chat thing, so I didn't see. Okay, um, how can I get your contact info? Uh, send me an email. I'll send okay. it to Robert and put you two together. Great, thank you. Okay. And to add to what Haima said about failing a thousand and one times, it inspires me when I read that quote and look at the Swami. There's actually like a picture of him saying that. 
because yeah. um, I've certainly fail and fail and fail in my spiritual attempts, but it's well, good to what, know that. What did Yoda say? What did Yoda say in Star Wars? The difference between the, the, with you. the master, <laughs> the difference in the novice between the novice and the master is that the master has failed more times than the novice has even tried. Wow. We, it's amazing how Star Wars incorporates a lot of Vedantic philosophy. Well, that's because that's because uh, uh, what's his name? George Lucas's advisor was Joseph Campbell, oh. who was who was at one time president of the Ramakrishna Vivekananda Society of New York. The East. Oh, that explains it, because you can't watch the movie and help but notice there's a lot of Vedanta philosophy in these movies. Okay, that explains it. That's that, that's. Joseph Campbell was the one who encouraged George Lucas to start that adventure. And even in the evil Darth Vader, it turns out there's some good in him at the end. <laughs> I always say you can't, you have to get it wrong before you can get it right. Well, and, as a and, the, as and a, the more times you get it wrong, the better it is when you get it right. <laughs> well, as a as a as a as a consummately skilled musician, Robert, you know exactly whereof you speak, you know, and you 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 play it and play it as that great Australian singer whose name I can't remember right now said, if you if you want to perform a song, sing it 100 times to yourself before. So, so the we 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 are. But the the thing for us to keep in mind, aren't we all so very glad we're alive? Aren't we all so very glad we're on this adventure? Yes, we want to be done with it. Yes, we want to learn what we need to know and practice what we need to practice to free ourselves from limitation. But it isn't that we want to just stop the world I want to get off. No, I want to become more and more. I want to become less and less limited, more and more happy. And, uh, and those are the blessed and blissful aims of spiritual life. And as we learn to know that living presence that's within us and identify with it more and more, the, you, the word used in this uh, talk we're uh, reading today is Atman. But you, know, we, you can call it by any name you wish, you know, whatever of the divine names or make up your own. You know? Somebody, somebody that I, I know calls that loving presence within Mr. T. <laughs> so uh, the, the, we we are on a, a great and wonderful adventure together. That's why that prayer that starts this is so powerful. Let's go forward together. What a joy. And I'm going to close as I have been recently with this because it's so, so, so richly needed in, in the world we live in today for all of us to just emanate this. Let there be peace in outer space. Let there be peace in the sky, on the earth and in the water. It's a very interesting class. Let there be peace in the herbs, the plants. That would be the because trunk. of how many people. Nira, Nira, you, you, you need oh. to mute yourself. Thank you, dear. Let there be peace in outer space. Let there be peace in the sky, on the earth, and in the waters. Let there be peace in the herbs, the plants, and the trees. May the gods be peaceful. May the whole universe be pervaded by peace. Let that infinite universal peace prevail throughout my being. Om Shanti.
Shanti, Shanti, peace, peace, peace be unto us and to all beloved beings everywhere. Any final thoughts from anyone? All right. Jai Shri Guru Maharaj Ji Ki Jai, Durga Durga Durga. May you be safe. May you be healthy. May you be cheerful. May you have peace of mind. May you go forward in the Divine Presence's loving and protective embrace. Tomorrow morning, we will talk about Sri Chaitanya and his prayer. Chaitanya's prayer, the title of the talk is Chaitanya's Prayer, the Perfect Prayer. That's what we'll talk about at 11 o'clock tomorrow morning. Brother Shankar, I just wanted to clarify. You said uh, the actual prayer will be in the newsletter? No, 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 it'll be it'll be on the website after the talk. It's, it's there if you go and look. You know, I've given the talk before and uh, it's, it's there already. Uh, just, just go on our website and search for uh, or don't <laughs> or don't yet it'll be up um, okay it'll in any up. event it'll be up with uh, this this yeah. coming talk okay okay so you can download it as a pdf okay and uh uh just uh, anything you want or need you can always email me and uh, I'll do what I can. All right. Anything else from anyone, dears? All right. Thank you, Until, Brother Shankara. Until next time, dears. Jai Shri Guru Maharaj.